Welcome to the newest episode, a midweek edition of Beatin' and Bangin'. I'm your host, Kyle Dalton. We've got quite a bit to cover in today's video, including some surprising remarks by Kevin Harvick on his podcast, calling out Martin Truex Jr. for his behavior after Richmond, and in Harvick's words, blowing off team owner Joe Gibbs. Plus, I've got some thoughts in response to NASCAR's comments on the Denny Hamlin restart at Richmond and the unacceptable explanation provided. However, before we get to those items, I wanted to talk about a couple of other surprising news nuggets unexpectedly dropped yesterday by Fox's Chris Myers on X. The veteran broadcaster shared a post that read, Don't expect NASCAR to race on Easter Sunday in the near future or at the Los Angeles Coliseum but you can expect racing in Southern California at a track yet to be determined. While there have been rumors about not returning to the LA Coliseum for the clash, Meyer's words seem pretty definitive about no longer racing inside the historic stadium. I get it, it's run its course there, but I hope this is something that NASCAR doesn't abandon altogether and races in more stadiums in the future. Jerry World, anyone? As for racing in Southern California continuing, there's a lot of speculation on where that might be. We'll just have to wait and see what happens. And Meyer's second headline maker is interesting, especially because of the timing, coming just a few days after the Easter race at Richmond. That makes it seem all the more relevant. It's obvious the announcer has been given the inside information on both items and he shared them on his timeline. Intriguing stuff. Moving on to the main storyline being discussed this week. Denny Hamlin jumping the final restart at Richmond. First of all, it's established that Hamlin did, in fact, jump the restart. Don't take my words. Listen to what NASCAR Vice President of Competition Elton Sawyer had to say about it on Sirius XM NASCAR Radio yesterday. First and foremost, you know, the 11 is the control vehicle. They have, they have earned the right to be in that position. They've, they've won the battle off pit road. They put themselves in a position to be able to control the restart. And as I looked at it yesterday, again, multiple times, there, there's no doubt he, he rolled early. Um, and, you know, again, it's a bang-bang call. It's at the end of the race. Um, you know, we're a live sporting event we, we don't have the um, luxury of a timeout and, and go to the sideline and review it and, and make that call um, if this happens at lap 10 or 50 or 300 um, you know the, the call could have been different so um, I wouldn't if I'm a competitor I wouldn't be playing that game every week there's a lot to unpack there so let's start with Sawyer's first point on how Hamlin won the battle off pit road and earned the right to be the control car. He did indeed earn that right to control the start, but from that area in between where those two white lines are clearly painted on the track, not outside of them. The second point Sawyer made was it was a bang bang call and it was a live sporting event and they didn't have the luxury of a timeout and the ability to go to the sideline and review it and make the call. Say what? When I heard that, I have to admit I immediately had flashbacks to a race I covered at Texas a couple of years ago when, ironically enough, Denny Hamlin was involved in another controversial call that NASCAR missed. Except this time, the Joe Gibbs racing driver wasn't the benefactor. It was when William Byron was frustrated by a move made by Hamlin and retaliated under caution, sending the number 11 for a spin. After the race, then NASCAR Vice President of Competition Scott Miller said the following. So uh, I'll have to be honest with you, Bob, when we were in the tower, we were paying more attention to the actual cause of the caution uh, up there and dispatching our equipment. Uh, the William Byron, Denny Hamlin thing, we had no eyes on. We saw Denny go through the grass and by the time we got to uh, a replay that showed the incident well enough to do anything to it, we'd gone back to green, but um, I'm not sure that um, that issue is completely resolved as of yet so we'll be looking at uh we'll be looking at that when we get back to back to work nascar wasn't done with the matter and docked byron and his number 24 team 25 points respectively and fined him fifty thousand dollars which was eventually changed by the national motorsports panel of appeals and the hms team didn't lose any points but was fined one hundred thousand dollars but that situation and miller's comments made it clear that NASCAR officials got caught with their pants down. 
back to Richmond. And Sawyer's remarks indicate the same sort of thing happened. He even doubled down on NASCAR's response and what he had to say later in the evening on NASCAR Race Hub. He definitely fired before the zone um, and with the in, uh, information and data we had at that time, um, and I still stand by the call that we made at the track. We officiate the races from lap one to lap 400 plus if we end up in those situations in overtime. We're going to officiate the race the same way. I admit it. That's a lot to digest. But let me try and see if I understand what he's saying. First, he admits Hamlin was guilty of firing before the line. Second, he says based on information they had at the time, they made the right call. More on having that information in a second. And then Sawyer says they'll officiate the race the same if it's a restart on lap 40, 50, 300, or 400. Uh, no, you clearly didn't. You didn't officiate the same on that final restart and even, to your credit, admitted as much. So that takes us to the million dollar question. Why? Why doesn't NASCAR have that kind of information immediately available to make a ruling? On the same race hub, Andy Petrie asked Sawyer about the potential use of technology and timing loops that are used on pit road for speeding and using them for the restart zone. Sawyer said that was a great point and something for NASCAR to look at. Interestingly, later in the day on his podcast, Kevin Harvick said something very similar. Take a listen. Put a speed line there, just like they do on pit road. Make the speed entering the box. X amount, give them five miles an hour, whatever the pace car speed is, plus five miles an hour, and put a line across the racetrack. And, and if you're faster than that with the length of the car, the restart zone, the computer can call the penalty. It really sounds like NASCAR has the answer. Let's just say they do incorporate something similar to what Petrie and Harvick suggested. Here's what I suggest Sawyer and NASCAR officials should do with that going forward, and it will create some suspense and drama. If there's a call in question like that restart, NASCAR, as it does on other restarts, says it's under review. That's shared with fans on the broadcast. And NASCAR has as much time as it wants to review. If it takes 10 minutes, then it takes 10 minutes. I think that's way too long, but I'm okay as long as they get the call right. Can you imagine the camera close-ups of Hamlin, Truex, Logano, and Larson all watching the screen to see what NASCAR decides and who is the winner. That would make for great TV. But more importantly, the correct call would be made and this whole discussion never ever happens. Please NASCAR, do the right thing. And finally, our last story comes from that same Happy Hour podcast. The 2014 champ talked about Martin Truex Jr. being unhappy after Sunday's race and his actions driving into the rear of his JGR teammate, door slamming Kyle Larson, and then the former Stuart Haas racing driver brought up something that happened between Truex and team owner Joe Gibbs that included previously unseen footage. Watch this. I think as you see this footage with Martin and, and Joe Gibbs right here and, and just, the, just the fact that uh, I don't know what was said to Joe right there, getting in a war with Kyle Larson right. and then slamming into the back of Denny Hamlin's car. Uh, several times, and then we come on pit road and, and blow off your owners. Harvick said moments later that there seemed to be more to Truex's frustration than just that last restart and losing the race he had dominated. He also brought up how Truex got beat off pit road by the number 11 crew that included previous members of his team. Hamlin also mentioned something similar on his podcast. Whatever the reason for Truex's frustration, it clearly hit a boiling point on Sunday at Richmond. You could try and read between the lines and suggest this means Truex is done racing and ready to retire. I don't know about that. We've been down this road before. I wrote about it last year, how unhappy he was at certain points of the season, and he still returned this year. I'm just going to chalk it up to he was justifiably disappointed with the ending, and it was a culmination of factors, including his team getting beat off of pit road, Hamlin jumping the restart, and then the feeling that his JGR teammate moved him up the track on those final laps. It'll definitely be interesting to see where this whole thing goes. All right, guys, that'll do it for this episode. I want to hear your thoughts. Are you happy that we won't be racing on Easter and in the LA Coliseum going forward? And what did you think about NASCAR's explanation on that restart? Are you surprised or is this just business as normal in your eyes? 
And what about that video with Truex and Gibbs? Is this much ado about nothing or is there something else there? Just a reminder, if you want to read my written work, go check it out at heavy.com and beatingandbanging.com. Also on my website, you can become one of many who have signed up for my email newsletter. We will get my weekly report every Friday, recapping the top stories from the week, including reviews of the various NASCAR related podcasts. Thanks again for supporting the channel and have a great rest of your day.